So there are many cognitive syndromes that are desperately in need of treatments. And here's the list. It, of course, includes the dementias, but also neuropsychiatric disorders and developmental conditions. I'm going to talk about three of these in this talk, um, exemplifying the use of Cantab. Now, we all know, especially now, about the problems of translation that Big Pharma have had in particular, which we have tried to address. And you know, top of the list, I think, has been the, the poverty and naivety in the use of animal models. Now, animal models of neuropsychiatric disorders are very controversial and difficult. And I, I just might mm -hmm. like to make a point at the beginning that models instantiate two main components. So, of course, there is the notion of a disease model, for example, in Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease, mimicking the pathology of the disorder. Much more difficult in psychiatric disorders, of course, um, where it's, it's difficult to simulate, even with genetic models, the basis of a neuropsychiatric disorder. But the other part of the model is, is what you measure. And of course, in neuropsychiatry, what you should be measuring is behavior or cognition. And in order to translate your observations from animal models to humans, clearly, one has to be measuring similar hopefully similar outcomes which are readily translatable and hence predictable. We would further argue that the, the big problems we've had with phase three trials are not really at the door of animal models. I think it's been said that it's been difficult to predict from phase two to phase three, let alone from animal models to phase three. So we shouldn't perhaps blame animal models. Um, but clearly there is a great need to construct a bridge between animal models or preclinical psychopharmacology and phase three trials. And Cantab, we think, would help to do that, as well as perhaps uh, more accurately measure performance and also more accurately designate homogeneous populations, um, which would be of great use in improving the accuracy of phase three trials. So just to make the general point that there are tests available now, for example, of memory function, which extend across species. And I'm not going to go into these in great detail. You'll recognize the, the famous Morris Water Maze in the top left and the virtual reality version of the task um, uh, for humans. But Cantab obviously comes well within this ambit. And a particular example of a memory test for Cantab is a so-called paired associates learning test where subjects are confronted with these boxes and asked to remember the location of the icons that I briefly presented and then they're tested and of course all of you will remember that this icon was in the northwest box where you would have to remember all of the subsequent icons as well. Now this test um, activates the hippocampus so this is precisely what we predicted it's an assay if you like of hippocampal function, and it was eventually translated, as we know, to uh, an iPad and used in GP clinics as an approved medical device in Cantab Mobile. So that's an example, perhaps, of the second type of translational gap from the science to the bedside. Now, I'll just show you my favourite um, study of all of Cantab. This is by Swainson et al., 2001. And it's, it's shown in the highlight events of the history of Cantab in your brochure. This is um, a study conducted um, with industry, actually, in collaboration with GSK and MRC support, in this case, uh, where we tested Cantab um, tests against several other classical instruments, including logical memory and the famous ADAS-COG uh, scale for measuring cognition in demented patients and considered four groups of subjects, uh, one subject group with Alzheimer's disease, um, a healthy um, age and pre-morbid IQ match group of control subjects, a positive control group of patients with elderly depression but no obvious cognitive deficits, and a group of patients presenting at a memory clinic with subjective memory loss. And, of course, the Alzheimer patients generally fail the test at six boxes, 
as you see here. Um, only one overlap with the normal population, um, probably because this person was very intelligent and had cognitive reserve. But you can see, most intriguingly, how the questionable dementia group, these probable mild cognitive impairment patients, are pulled apart by the panel test, with one group representing controls and the other group representing patients. And indeed, many of these, many of these patients went on to show progression in the deficit and had a, an eventual diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, often within about 28 months of initial testing. So the important point here is um, this may be an instrument, therefore, for early detection and defining groups for the protective treatments that have been evolved for Alzheimer's disease. But also in comparison with other instruments, as you see, ADAS cog did very poorly in differentiating this subgroup, as did a CANTAB test, recognition memory, showing probably that recognition memory isn't the best um, assay, if you like, of the initial memory disorder. One needs something more complex related to hippocampal function. And logical memory, a common uh, waste test, a Wexler memory test, also uh, showed no real sensitivity. So this is interesting, and it's been uh, also translated across species, as you'll hear from Tim Bussey in his elegant work in rodents. But I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on tests of frontoexecutive function, tests of working memory, response inhibition, cognitive flexibility and sustained attention, which engage the frontal systems of the brain. And this makes an important point that if one compares animal studies with humans, one can't always be sure that the animals are solving the tests in the same way as humans. So one criterion for achieving this matching is to examine which neural systems are implicated in the performance of the test. And by this triangulation, if one finds, for example, that um, the same areas of the brain, by homology, are involved in performance of the test, then one has greater confidence, perhaps, that one is measuring um, something similar. And the classic test of frontal lobe function in the 1980s is the wisconsin Castle test, which I demonstrated on a recent Horizon program. And um, this is well known to be sensitive to frontal lobe damage. And for those of you unaware of the test, there are, uh, uh, one, one presents the patient with a pack of cards, which vary in these three perceptual attributes, and the subject has to learn a rule for sorting the cards, for example, by colour. Now, we went on, of course, and showed elements of the neural network which controls this behaviour. So, for example, um, reversal learning is governed by um, projections to the stratum from the orbitofrontal cortex, um, as shown here in this mapping study. And when, again, this area is damaged, you can see the profound deficit caused by medial straital lesions who never get the idea of reversing across successive reversals, whereas control animals um, reverse almost perfectly after three or four goes. So you can see the development of showing a, a neural network in control of this form of cognitive flexibility. Now, remarkably, a former graduate student, now professor at St Andrews University, Verity Brown and her students, uh, generalised this test to rodents. Um, they used exactly the same logic, but different stimuli. Um, they used sands of different texture, coarse or fine, perfumed in different ways, and again studied shifts and reversals in much the same way as we've done in monkeys. And remarkably, from my perspective, they were able to show that damage to the orbital frontal cortex produced the same reversal deficit, in these rodents, whereas damage to more medial frontal cortex structures produce the opposite rule shift deficit. So again, this, this conservation of these two forms of flexibility in different neural systems across species. Quite remarkable, I, th I th felt at the time. And also allowing, of course, enormous uh, opportunity for the use of this test in, in the context of drug screening in pharmaceutical industries. Well, the test also generalised the other way. So this is a study of Adrian Owen and, and others using, again, different stimuli, faces and houses, but the same logic 
to show, in, using the bold response with fMRI, that reversal learning activates a network including the orbitofrontal cortex, um, which is here, as you see, whereas the conceptual shift, the ED shift, activates the more lateral areas of the cortex, as predicted from the monkey study. Furthermore, this distinction works neurochemically, so again, going back to the monkey, manipulations of the catecholamine systems, particularly dopamine, seems to affect ED shifting, the extra-dimensional shift, whereas manipulations of serotonin, probably because it's very dense in ventral frontal cortex, um, selectively affected reversal learning. So again, a remarkable distinction between these two forms of plasticity. This translated rather well to humans, as you see from this quite old study of Rob Rogers, where we manipulated Ritalin, um, which is a catecholamine agonist, dopamine and noradrenaline, and improved extra-dimensional shifting, as you see here, quite dramatically, in terms of the number of errors um, to reach criterion in comparison to controls. And here we have the effects of manipulating serotonin um, with dietary tryptophan manipulations, and this manipulation selectively affected reversal learning rather than shifting. So again, this double dissociation found in the monkey translated to normal volunteers. So now we go to the human version of CANTAB, and this is the same stimuli used as for monkeys in this suite of discriminations, including these critical shifts, and applied to the important issues of deficits of flexibility in schizophrenia. So cognitive symptoms, uh, of, of course, are very prominent in schizophrenia and a barrier to rehabilitation and also a challenge to the pharmaceutical industry to um, remediate. Chris Pantelis, uh, in collaboration with us several years ago, showed that in addition to the predicted effect of frontal damage in humans, which affects the extra-dimensional shift uh, performance in terms of the number of volunteers passing the test, as you see here. In the case of chronic schizophrenia, they perform badly at almost all stages, including the intradimensional shift and reversal, but also the extra-dimensional shift. So this test tended to be very sensitive to schizophrenia. And this was capitalised on in this uh, proof-of-principle study of Barbara Sahakians with modafinil, shown in this crossover double-blind study that uh, a group of schizophrenics responded to modafinil showing normal performance on the shifting task um, um, in this you know, rather simple experimental medicine type of study. What's remarkable to me is that Rebecca Diaz then back-translated this result uh, with a model of schizophrenia using chronic PCP, the NMDA receptor antagonist, which produces marked deficits, particularly in shifting in this task. And as you see here, remarkably, modafinil um, normalises performance in this test. Look at this huge effect. So you'd never normally do this study um, unless you'd done the human study. And Rebecca had the vision to say, well, would this work in animals? And she, she back-translated it with an animal model. And it works, which somehow gives you confidence that something interesting here is going on. Well, we've used the very same test in collaboration with Eli Lilly uh, to test the effects of their mGluR5 potentiator. This is with Francois Gaston Bede. And again, you get really quite a remarkable improvement of both ED shifting and reversal learning, which is notably impaired in early schizophrenia, as um, we showed in a study with Eileen Joyce. So this is just to give you a flavour of what I mean by translation. You know, from humans to rodents, and mice, of course, have been shown to do the DID task, and with the same two systems as demonstrated in the rat. So this shows a generalisation across all four species. Quite remarkable. OK, so David Beckham. Who's that? <coughs> Charles Dickens. Donald Trump. Cameron Diaz. Martin Luther, Justin Timberlake, Samuel Johnson, Howard Hawks, Howard Hughes, I should say, Leo, Leo DiCaprio, and Hans Christian Andersen all had clinical symptoms of OCD. 
which is the final syndrome I'm going to describe today, because it's a very interesting parallel uh, with schizophrenia. And using the, the Owen Hampshire imaging assay, if you like, uh, Sam Chamberlain was able to compare um, not only patients with OCD, but also their unaffected relatives. So this is a, an endophenotype study to see whether this cognitive rigidity, if you like, is present in these patients, but also their relatives. Maybe it's a family-related thing, possibly genes or indeed environment. And we replicated the same pattern of activations that Hampshire and Owen had shown, but um, Sam shows here the reduction in activation, not only in OCD patients in the open histograms, but also in their relatives. So this shows, I think, quite a remarkable um, neuroendophenotype signature which seems to be related to OCD. Now, not only are OCD patients inflexible in terms of reversal learning, which implicates this orbitofrontal cortex loop, but they're also impaired in extra-dimensional set shifting. And again, this is a Chamberlain study, and this is errors to criterion for the control intradimensional shift versus the extra-dimensional shift. And as you can see, both patients and their relatives do worse on this shift. So again, it's endophenotypical. And there are other tasks like the STOP tasks which show a similar result for these patient groups. Extremely interesting. So there seem to be some basic problems of shifting and inhibition in OCD which may contribute to the clinical phenotype. Now I just wanted to conclude the talk by showing you some recent data because we don't like standing still in Cambridge and just reflecting on the past, although it is fun to reflect on the past. So these are very recent data of um, Matilda Vaghi and Anamika Pogishut and, and others in our lab showing a replication of this effect, this deficit of ED shifting in OCD, but this time with suitably large numbers to test the effects of medication. Now, of course, OCD is medicated with drugs which enhance serotonergic function. Um, and, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, like most of the SSRIs. But as you can see, medication has no great effect on this deficit. So it's not caused by medication and it's not improved by medication, which if you think about it is consistent with what I showed you earlier in the monkey data that serotonin is linked to another type of flexibility and one wouldn't expect an improvement in this. So I think that's quite a nice replication and it's part of a, a larger study which um, looks at other aspects of cognition and also um, relationships to brain function. So again, this is a very recent study of, uh, of, of us showing the effects of medication on performance of the memory task I presented earlier. And here, intriguingly, we find that medication doesn't always do good things. Um, it actually impairs uh, performance in this memory task in patients with OCD. So here's a very interesting example of highlighting something previously unsuspected that... Um, this medication for the disorder actually has adverse effects. Okay, so in a very, I think, interesting development, we've started to use um, resting state uh, methods to track the neural networks um, correlated with these types of performance. This is work of Mathilde Vaghi. And in resting state MR, of course, the subject lies down flat in the scanner with her eyes closed and you simply measure the, if you like, the correlations between bold responses in different parts of the brain as proxy measures of connectivity. And then what you do is see whether that has any reality to the outside world by seeing whether there's a correlation with performance in tests conducted outside the scanner, for example. And so this, these are very recent data of Mathilde showing performance on the ED shift to the task, and again, remember the colossal deficit in patients with OCD, but this time related to measures of functional connectivity between regions of the frontal cortex and the basal ganglia, which of course were predicted on the basis of our experiments with monkeys. So I think these are remarkable data because in terms of the ED shift, it's the first real evidence we have of a frontostriatal pathway mediating performance rather than 
possibly cortico-cortical connections. But we mustn't stop still with the Kentair battery. The Kentair battery evolves, and as you're going to be hearing from Rebecca Elliott later today, we've, we're also very interested in other domains of cognition and behaviour, including, for example, emotion, motivation and reward, um, and measures of social cognition. And um, the so-called emoticon battery, which has involved a collaboration between all of our old Cantab graduates, as it were, um, is something which Rebecca will tell you about later, I hope. So finally, I'd like to thank my immediate collaborators. I'm just picking up some of these uh, memories of, of work on schizophrenia with Chris Pantelis, Nileen Joyce, <coughs> Naomi Feinberg, Rose C.D., and obviously some of the animal researchers, particularly in the non-human primates, um, that has contributed to this translational neuropsychopharmacology. Thank you.